Welcome to St. John's United Church of Christ, located in the Mansion Hill neighborhood of Newport, Kentucky. I'm Reverend Marty Westermeyer, the designated pulpit supply. We're glad that you're with us to worship with our online worship. It is our hope and prayer that you may be spiritually uplifted by God's word read and proclaimed, by the prayers and the liturgy, and by the music offered by our musicians. It is my hope and prayer that you will be touched by and know God in a significant way. Let us worship God.
Good morning. If you have a copy of the bulletin, please join me in the call to worship. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river. Shall we gather at the river? A river whose streams make glad the city of God, the beautiful, the beautiful river. A river whose streams make glad the holy habitation of the Most High. Shall we gather at the river that flows by the throne of God? Let us together worship our God. Again, if you have the bulletin, please join me in the prayer of adoration and confession. God of grace, we confess to you the sin of our pride. Too often our confidence is placed in ourselves and our accomplishments. Too often we take off in our own direction, leaving you, your word, and the care of our neighbor behind. Give us confidence, God, but let it be grounded in your grace, in, Lord, in our Lord Jesus Christ, O God. When pride does not overwhelm us, our own despair does. We confess to you those times of hopelessness and uncertainty. Steady us when we are afraid to trust in you and act according to your good purposes. Give us courage and faith grounded in your grace given to us in Jesus Christ. Above all, assure us that, as the, as the Apostle Paul preached, you are faithful, passing over our sins and rescuing us with forgiveness through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the good news. God has gifted us with this time to repent and receive the assurance of forgiveness through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity to look differently upon that time that is now, to become wise in the use of our days, and to live the love that we have been shown. Thanks be to God. Dearly beloved, believe the good news. The scripture from the Hebrew Bible today is from Leviticus 19, uh, verses 1 and 2. Pay careful attention. These are powerful admonitions. Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance nor bear a grudge against any of your people but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord.
The reading from the first reading from the New Testament is again from uh, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from de deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed. Nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or others. Though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Today, as we come to God in prayer, let us open our minds and hearts in an attitude that allows God's spirit to move among us. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we are grateful for this day that you have given us to worship you, to be together and to prepare ourselves for another week. And on this day, we want to remember the day of Reformation, those years ago when people saw the need for a reformation of the church, a time for cleansing, a time for remembering a time when we begin to experience you in a new way. Those early reformers were not protesters against, nor are we. They were witnesses for you and the word, and we too have come to be inspired by that same living word. We want to witness the truth of, of life your word declares. Help us to be truthful at all times and in all places, even when the truth hurts us. We want to witness the faith, for faith is life, not works. Faith is what we always hope for, and hope in you it gives us that kind of hope that never lets us down. Those reformers were doubters, doubters of what was real and what was just for self. And when our minds insist on evidence before belief, lead us in using our minds to search for what is true. And when we become doubters in order to save ourselves, take us through our doubts to firm foundations for a faith that lives. When we doubt in order to find certainty through our own experiences, guide us to those experiences we need to be certain of your presence. The reformers, O oh God, were not divisive folks. They sought a unity of spirit. So as we gather together, may we be aware of the spirit that is moving through other gathered congregations that speaks of unity of hearts and minds among Christians and with a different name that what we profess the same God, the same Christ and a Holy Spirit that leads us all. We remember today those individuals and situations we have raised within our hearts and minds. Send the Spirit of Christ to guide us as we go forth to serve. It is in Jesus' name we pray the prayer that he has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My name is Tom Williams, and I've been a member here at St. John's UCC of Newport for 21 years, and I've been asked to talk about stewardship. The first important step in good stewardship is knowing why this church exists and what we are trying to accomplish. This is done by creating a mission, vision, and values statement. The first step sets the direction and decision to make a model for the church. The next step is to look at the strategic objectives that require financial support and allocate dollars for these church goals. Spending decisions will be made as money is allocated to fund various ministries, 
and using wisdom spending is critical to good stewardship. A good decision model helps to determine if this is something we want, need, or have to have. A church budget guides spending decisions. However, it is important to make sure the budgeted monies are spent on what it was allocated for. Do not have a conflict of interest. Spending ministry resources should be made with the interests of the church in mind. We should not lose sight of the fact that we are stewards in promoting God's way. I believe that the people on the leadership team are doing these things and have done a great job. We are currently discerning on how, with God's help, we can find ways to increase our membership in order to better do God's work. If you don't have a church home, won't you consider coming and joining with us?
Our gospel lesson today is coming from the Gospel of Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 34 through 46, where we hear about the greatest commandment, and then this question that is offered about Jesus as being David's son. So when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the greatest and the first commandment. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. And he said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And no one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. May God bless this reading, hearing, and understanding of his holy word. Total discipleship is both a challenge and a comfort. And therefore, Jesus is both calling us and caring for us as he uses a response to a critical question as his vehicle to do that. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength is a big order. But if you check this same text and story with Gospel of Mark, he says our discipleship is with all our heart understanding, and strength. So the different words that are used by the two gospel writers tell us that the important word is all, not what we are to do when we love him. So this experience of Christ with the Pharisees that we heard about, or the widow story that we know who gave her might helps us. Jesus commends the widow. Why? Because she gave her all. He didn't commend the amount, but all that she gave. If you remember the story of the, great, the, the pearl of great price, Jesus states that the merchant sold all of his possessions in order to secure that pearl. And he told that in relationship to discipleship, to the kingdom or the realm of God. So the question for today, quite simply, is it possible to be a part-time Christian? Or more properly, is it possible to be a partial Christian? So the answer of Christ would seem to be today, no. For some, this call to total discipleship or total commitment is too much. And they, like the story of the rich young ruler, they want to want to turn and walk away. And our response is, why don't you wait? God does not make demands without providing some kind of resource. In my career, in a lot of the churches I have served, sometimes there is a confessional, and it goes like this in most churches, something like, Almighty God, until whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in response to that is a, an absolution or assurance of pardon, which says something like, in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you and for his sake. God forgives you of all your sins. The challenge of total discipleship is matched and bettered by God who gives it his all to us in Christ and accepts all of us, our whole being, and has forgiven us totally. So that's the answer to our question or partial commitment. God sets the pace, but is encouraging us to respond. The exciting part of this security and comfort is that comes from this relationship is that no longer do guilt and shame take precedence, and no longer do jealousy and envy have a place, or that keeping up with the Joneses standard that we sometimes buy into, that gets set aside. When you give your all to God, you don't worry about the comparisons between other people. And once the commitment is total, then you know that God cares for you because of who you are, your willingness to be in a relationship with God not how much you have done or done to someone else. 
It doesn't take a special person to be a Christian, but it takes all of any person to be a Christian. For most of us, most of the time, we live our lives in uh, segments or compartments, and we measure time as how much we spend in working or traveling or eating or sleeping. We give so much time to our family, we give so much time to our work, we give so much time to our faith. Maybe we even count up those times and keep a chart. But total discipleship allows a different uh, perception or perspective on living. It's not a portion of our time that we give to our faith, but the permeation, if I can use that word, of all of the time and all of the activity that we do. That's all discipleship. So a person is a Christian, whether you're at work or with family or community service or whatever. All of life and every activity of living is seen through the eyes of the kingdom or the realm of God. The one thing we need to remember is we'll never understand the message if we don't know the source. So it's when we come to understand the nature of God, God that's loving and full of life, then we can respond to God's call for this total commitment. And there are five points I think can summarize. There might be more, but I just want to raise those five today. God's call is to life. You know, he says, I have come that they may have life more abundantly. Two, God doesn't expect more from you than you can give. You know, it's like the story of, of Jesus and the young boy in the Gospel of John with the five barley loaves and the two fish, and Jesus blesses it and feeds the entire multitude when the disciples thought there wasn't enough. Three, the call to total commitment is as comforting as it is frightening. You don't have to worry about being in comparison with somebody else in the world. If you give all over to what you can control, let God take care of the other people. We take care of ourselves. When you need help in deciding what to do, think of the questions. Who is in control of my life? What is the object of my business or maybe busyness? Where am I headed? Ultimately, where am I going? And lastly, when your life is totally committed to God, you can truly receive, respond, and rejoice in your daily living because you know that you belong. You belong to God. You are grounded in something and that God will take care of you. I think those points summarize our attitude and our commitment to a loving God. And then we should be able to understand the words of Jesus when he says to us, the greatest commandment is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love all. Amen.
Today we were reminded in the scripture that we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And that you were to live each and every day in that prism of being a Christian. So live your life to its fullest. Share with one another the good news of Jesus Christ. So let us go in the name of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us go in peace.